Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is Tuesday, January 18th, 2011, and our special guest tonight is Will Richardson. Will, how do you like that uh, little facilitator really nice. package there? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty nice. I wish I, I wish I could say that it was anything other than the fact that I couldn't find an image of the book easily, but here we get to advertise the whole kit and caboodle. There you go. Anyway, Will is the author of blogs, wikis, podcasts, and other powerful web tools for classrooms, and now in its third edition. And he does much more than that, but we're sure glad to have Will here. Future of Education is sponsored by my employer, Illuminate. The project I work on is LearnCentral.org. It's a free social network for educators with Illuminate baked in. And Will, thanks for turning your mic off. It does sound a lot better when you do that. And uh, please feel free to come to Learn Central. You do have the free use of uh, Illuminate View Room there as well. Coming up on the Future of Education tomorrow night, Yang Zhao talks to us about Tiger Moms. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, Yang is, uh, uh, wrote a book called uh, Catching Up or Leading the Way. It looks at Chinese education versus American education. And he's specifically going to talk to us about the PISA test and Tiger Moms. Barnett Berry on Thursday, Teaching 2030. Karen Cater, tentatively scheduled for Monday. I thought that was firm, but she's emailed me. They may have a problem with that. But that's supposed to be Monday at noon Pacific. Gary Stager the next day. Love that that back-to-back -back lineup. <clears throat> Michael Horn on Wednesday, uh, a little bit earlier at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 Eastern, to talk about the new version of Disrupting Class and to look at, um, at uh, how that uh, those predictions have been. David Wiley on Open Education. You can see lots of fun coming up. David Perkins, Kevin Kelly. Uh, Mitch Resnick just confirmed today on March 10th from MIT Media Lab. Um, he'll talk about Scratch and uh, star logo and lots of fun stuff like that. Um, and Barry Schwartz, not really an education interview, but on the paradox of choice, a very interesting book, and it should be a lot of fun, as well as uh, Chris, and I'm not going to know how to say his last name, Gibo, Gibo, on the art of nonconformity. Uh, and then uh, the authors of The Invisible Gorilla on June 7th. If you haven't seen this book, maybe the most interesting book I have read in a couple of years, The Invisible Gorilla. Uh, they're going to come on, and uh, that's just about the time the paperback version will be released. So lots of fun. Hope that you'll come and visit or join us for one of those. If you've missed an interview, they're all recorded. Uh, Ira David Sokol last week, Alfie Cohn before that, Deborah Meyer, Julie Young, lots of really, really interesting people. I have the best job in the world. So hopefully there's something there that will be of interest to you and that you'll find the recording valuable. There's all at futureofeducation.com, both the full Illuminate recordings and the MP3 files. Yeah, Temple Grandin would be fun. Okay, if this is your first time in Illuminate, the first thing I want you to do is to go up to View Layouts and switch to the Wide Layout. You'll have a much better experience with the chat. It is very hard to follow a chat uh, in a group of this size. We don't expect Will to follow the chat, so don't leave him a direct question expecting that he'll necessarily focus his attention on that. Also, with a group this large, it really makes a difference to keep the chat on task. So um, please don't I have a lot of side chatter that's unrelated to the topic because it can distract other people. Uh, although you can send a message to another individual in the chat, you'll notice that from the click down. Um, do be aware that Will and I and Aunt Tammy, who's going to be our question and answer moderator, can all see those messages so they're not fully private. At the bottom of the participant window are these little icons you can use to express emotion clapping hand, a smiley face, confused look, or a thumbs down. You'll notice a larger icon, a hand with a green up arrow. If you click on that, that will let us know that you would like to take the microphone. Please wait and do that when we get to the Q&A. If you do think you want to ask a question of Will uh, using the microphone, it is good at this time to go up to Tools Audio, run the Audio Setup Wizard, make sure your microphone is working OK. So we're going to give you a chance now to modify the whiteboard. I've given you whiteboard permissions, all of you. Look for a wand with a red star at the end to the left of the whiteboard. Click on that and then click on the map, and you can let us know where you're participating from. You can also put a shout out in the chat. There's Peru, Atlanta, a couple in Australia, India. Those in Asia, just let us know where you're listening from. What a lot of fun. Maybe the weather. Always fun to, to have an international crowd. A 
Wow, look at all of that. Okay, well, we sure appreciate your joining us tonight, wherever you are listening from. And if you're listening to the recording, thanks so much for making us a part of your day. So, Will, uh, I listen, as preparation for the interview, I listened to the interview we did, I think now, three or four years ago. And it was really fun to kind of hear you talking. Um, tell me a little bit about the third edition of the book and what kinds of changes you needed to make. Well, I think most of it, um, and it's kind of funny because my, uh, my editor is in the room tonight, which is, uh, is kind of cool. I'm glad she, I'm sure she's happy to see <laughs> the little graphic you put together there, so thanks. But um, I think most of it was just updating. I mean, what's really fun about um, being able to do editions, new editions of the book is, is uh, you know, keeping it current and didn't really change too much in terms of the tools. I think in the third edition we added uh, um, stuff about Facebook, and um, there may have been a couple other mentions of some tools, but mostly just getting new stories, new examples, um, trying to find other teachers who uh, are, you know, beginning to use these tools in some pretty interesting ways, and just trying to keep it as... as well, I lost your audio. ...as fresh as possible. Oh, so, there we go. Um, yeah, it, it's, it is really fun when you get a chance to do that. So, Will, you'll notice that everybody's got to slow down in their audio. I think maybe your connection slowed down just for a second there. Yeah, I hope that wasn't me. I, uh, it might be might the been. hotel connection or something. If it happens again, we'll be patient. You'll notice it because you'll see the little orange dots that you're probably familiar with. All right, hopefully it's catching up. I know I sound like a chipmunk. Okay, I'm going to ask the next question in anticipation of your being back in real time. Um, well, so I'm interested yeah. in how your own thoughts, though, may have evolved also over the last few years. Um, are, you know, are there things that you see differently now than you did, um, say, two years ago? Well, I think that um, it was, it's funny because I've actually been thinking about a, a blog post if I uh, ever get back to my blog, which hopefully I will here in the next couple of weeks. But um, it, it has been kind of interesting that um, as much as we've had a lot more people enter the conversation and uh, and we've had a lot more teachers, there's some just such great examples, you know, in our network, obviously, of teachers who are beginning to do some great things in the classroom and in schools. I'm still struck by um, how little this this conversation that we ha we are having in our network has really scaled. It, it it hasn't really scaled very much. It's not something that um, is uh, still on the on the radar. I don't think of most people on a national level. Uh, it doesn't really get into very many conversations around reform, um, and it, it's just it's still that it's just interesting to me that uh, for all of the uh, great stuff that's happening in classrooms, um, at the end of the day, it's not really been much of a part of the policy conversation that's been going on in terms of you know, how you really change things around learning, how you really begin to think differently about it. And um, uh, it's, it's uh, frustrating on some level, but I'm trying to figure out why that is. And, and I think it's because, obviously, the system is so ingrained in that it's just really difficult for anyone to, to really think differently about schools. I mean, to, to really change things is going to take a huge amount of effort and a huge amount of disruption. And, um, you know, it's going to take some some real leadership, I think, on a national level. So, I don't know. Um, I, I still think that this is an amazing time to be a learner. People who see me speak, I mean, I, I say that all the time and I really mean it. I, I can't imagine um, not looking at this moment and just being amazed by the types of things that we can do. But uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm equally amazed that it feels like about 90% of people, at least in the United States, uh, still don't have really any any uh, uh, real clue or any sense of these so, types of well, shifts that are happening. So, well, in to talk and, to you uh, tonight, I made I put my notes into two interesting categories. And frustrating and recognizing that a lot of the audience might be hearing levels. you for the first time, but others have maybe heard you for years. And I want to be careful about balancing those two interests. 
But uh, the, sort of the second category for me was the, the place you just jumped to, which is kind of the meta level. It's sort of uh, a higher view of education sure. and thinking about sort of transformation. And I'm going to channel Noam Chomsky here just for a minute. And I'm guessing you have some familiarity with him because of journalism. But basically the idea that um, when large institutions or financial conglomerates have control of the media, you're not likely to see uh, portrayals of stories about um, culture and society that don't conform to the stories that, that those large players want you to hear. And, and if that's true, and if sort of the grassroots level of blogging and social networking and personal learning networks um, now have the chance for voices to be heard, um, it, do you think that we're just experiencing the resistance of that message by sort of the traditional elements and that that's just going to be a part of the larger story? You know, I, I think it's a great question, and, and I'm not, I'm, I'm just not sure that there's enough space for this story yet. Um, the, the, the narrative is so just uh, overrun with, uh, you know, the, the Michelle Reeves and the Joel Kleins and the Bill Gates stories, the Oprah stories, the Superman stories that, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that there's a lot of space given to education or enough space given to education in the media in general. And when the media sees something that it thinks is um, is going to really play, I mean, they obviously jump on it, and that's what they've done. This, I think there are two problems, really, still. Um, you know, David Warlick, uh, a long time ago, um, was talking about, you know, what's the new story of education? What's the new story that we're trying to tell? And I, I still think we're, we're not quite there to having a coherent narrative for what learning looks like and for what education looks like that is consumable by lots of people. Um, and and I think until we get to that point, it's going to be it's going to be a bit of a struggle, to be honest with you. But I I just think that you know in in some ways um, this is just a shift that is occurring on such a level that um, I think it's just difficult for people to wrap their brains around it. And I am not sitting here telling you that I have my brain fully wrapped around what's happening with learning and education. I don't think anyone does. I don't think that there's any way you can accurately predict, you know, what schools are going to look like or what learning is going to look like. I think there are, are some trends. I think there um, are some directions that are, are fairly obvious now, and I think we've gotten a little bit closer to being able to, to define that. But, um, you know, for it to be, for it to scale um, and for real, uh, I think, you know, transformation to happen, um, it's going to take a lot more people in well, the conversation. Well, to what degree it's going is to take a lot more people who are advocating for schools to become different places from the places they are now, and that's going to take. You a can't long start time. with so what's really interesting to me and I then stop. Really you keep going. going. I've got go a ahead. written down question. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> All right. So what's really interesting to me what, right now is looking and seeing the different ways that people outside of education are beginning to attempt to make inroads into education and to, um, to individualize, customize, and personalize things for students um, uh, in ways that schools can't. Uh, I'll give you one great example. Um, Ignition Tutoring is the site that um, has uh, uh, just kind of come on my radar uh, over the last six months or so. But they have a, a kind of a promo video where um, one of their tutors is teaching slope uh, to a student uh, using the, the mentors on Skype, and they're having a Skype conversation about this. But the context of the, co of the lesson is plotting slope with the x-axis being the amount of time the kid plays Halo, and the y-axis being the number of kills that he gets in Halo with the amount of time that he plays. So 
um, you, you can, and this kid is just totally engaged, um, and and he is absolutely learning about slope um, based on the conversation because of the context, because of the ability to really put it into a context that he understands. Now, um, I really think that that is just a harbinger of things to come as more and more people become more and more adept at personalizing and customizing um, education and learning for kids. And, and I think the big fear that comes along with that is uh, is that when it gets really good, that the people who can uh, are going to uh, you know, start doing that, and the and the kids that can't, I think, um, and and this is something again that Halverson and Collins talked about in you know rethinking education in the age of technology. But but the kids that can't are going to be the ones that basically you know end up in in schools as as we know them. That's a big I think concern right now. But um, I just find it striking to to see how many different ways now we can so we yeah, had Ira David so call on the other night and, and one of the really um, striking to to trickle aspects down into schools, of his work is the degree to which he sort of says this is this is sort of the the third time there's been a large um, discussion about education that had uh, on the one side the kind of progressive Dewey like um, I'm trying to remember the name of the guy in the 1940s, uh, um, Alcott uh, side versus the sort of business perspective of what do we need to do to create uh, good workers. And I've wondered if there's just a dilemma in the whole notion of the factory model because it's making efficient a single process and and can we actually come up with a story that's just a single story, or do we have to now allow for multiple stories? And, and if we do so, um, you know, are we, uh, is that the end result of the prolifer proliferation of the web, is that we're going to with, end up with lots and lots of different stories, and we're going to have to be comfortable with lots and lots of different ways of doing things? Right, and so there's the meta story, right? And that's it. The, the new story is that there are going to be lots of stories. You know, the old story is there's one way, and, and that's you go to school, and you go through 12 years or however long it takes, and then you go to college if, if you're uh, lucky enough to do so, if you're so inclined. Um, that's the old story. The new story is there are going to be lots of different stories in terms of, of learning and, and, and getting educated. So um, how we make that acceptable, I think, is the key, right? Because, you know, and I, and I talk about my parenting, my parenthood, I should say, um, quite a bit. And as a parent, um, I'm, I'm searching for uh, someone to show me, and, and, and again, I'm uh, I'm, I'm kind of being a parent here in the general sense, right? That I'm searching for someone to to tell me what those new options are, to really kind of um, make the the system embrace all of those different types of roads and paths to learning that are possible now. So that is the story, and and uh, again, I think we're getting there. I think we're getting close. But um, I, I don't think that we have uh, gotten to the point yet where that is an acceptable narrative um, for a society that is as you know as as, as different as um, you know kind of uh, uh, has so many different constituencies, has so many different types of kids in different places. I mean, we're a very diverse place, and. Um, it, uh, it's, it, I, I just think it's going to take a little bit longer, and I, I, but I do think it's going to have to take someone on a larger scale um, uh, to get the message across that, um, you know, that fundamental... Well, so if Ira is right, education there's a very real risk that it would be impossible no longer for that to come from the top them. down because of the larger business interests. So in the work that you and Cheryl have done, you've been working with sort of larger educational organizations, I'm thinking districts maybe, or even larger than that. Are you seeing patterns of leadership that you feel serve as good models for um, that change coming from the top down?
Well, you know, the work that Cheryl and I do in Powerful Learning Practice is, is built around um, small cohorts of teams. There are a lot of peeps in the room tonight. A shout out to all the PL peeps. Thanks for, for coming tonight. But um, um, it's built around a model that says we take small teams from schools and then we connect those small five or six person teams with, you know, 20 other schools in a particular area and um, really try to immerse them into these kinds of social learning environments online so that they can can get a real practical sense in their own learning of what these changes look like, right? Um, we do have a few of our cohorts that are built around larger organizations and larger districts. And I know there are a couple people from actually the Archdiocese in Philadelphia. Ed Allen was in here. Ed's still here. Um, and um, a couple other people. You know, I, I think it's interesting the Archdiocese uh, has as an organization um, begun to have some, I think, real important conversations about what learning looks like and um, a willingness, I think, to to really consider change in a meaningful way. Um, I, I, I always found it a little bit ironic. You think of the Archdiocese as a group that probably would be more traditional and more conservative in the way that they think about it, but um, you know, Bill B, Bill Brannick is here and, and a number of other people. Um, I mean, there are a lot of archdiocese teachers now that are making forays into using Facebook in the classroom into, into um, really connecting with other teachers. I know Bill has been working with Shannon Miller and Van Meter and, um, you know, lots of those types of connections. So, um, you know, I, I think in a sense that type of a structure, having that kind of archdiocese structure might even facilitate these changes a little bit, a little bit more. Um, because, uh, you know, it can come from the top down. The superintendent has worked with us. She's been to our boot camps. She's, um, you know, done a lot of, uh, a, a lot of work with us. And uh, um, so there, there seems to be a systemic shift there at least. Um, but, you know, in, in, in other places uh, it's more difficult, I think. And that's why I, I do feel like if we could, you know, you're going to have Karen on next week, hopefully. I mean, I would ask her what, to what extent she feels that on a federal level um, people can start to advocate for some of the ideas and some of the, the uh, suggestions that are in the, the National Ed Tech Plan. Because I think there's some stuff in there that's, that's really interesting. And there's rhetoric in there, there's language in there that uh, I think, you know, the people in this network, the, you know, those of us who have been talking about this for a long time can really be comfortable with. So, you know, it does become a question, I, I think I was right in, in one sense, but I also think that at the end of the day, um, there has to be some uh, top-down, or not top-down, but at least some recognition from the people at the top that that uh, uh, these types of shifts that are occurring right now and, and the challenges that they that they pose for education uh, are going to have to be led uh, by you know in some way I think by by by, uh, by someone guiding it rather than uh, uh, you know a whole bunch of individual school districts trying to make those changes I'm not I'm just not sure that that's the way that the so very interesting you brought up the archdiocese another I think uh, but, uh, interesting example yeah. was I did an interview okay. with the folks at uh, BYU Idaho about their learning model that Anya Kamenetz mentions in her book and in both cases you have um, you have a cultural conformity that might allow for change that, that would be harder in a place that doesn't yeah. have that um, same uh, same kind of um, single focus um, uh, that, that uh, their religious context may provide. So it's sort of intriguing that in both those circumstances that shared culture allows for maybe a more, a little bit more rapid change. Okay, well I, I, I am sensitive to the fact that there are going to be people here for whom the, the Met is not the only conversation. So I'm going to shift back just a little bit to, um, to kind of the actual use cases and, and then we can kind of come back as we go to Q&A. So uh, when blogging first became popular it was being it was being discussed at a lot of educational technology conferences. There was this sense that there was a real personal value to blogging to the empty room, and that for that period of time that you were blogging to the empty room, you were um, kind of going through a personal process. Has that pretty much gone away as a rationale for blogging? 
Well, I don't know if it's gone away as a rationale, but it may be uh, going away as a reality. <laughs> I mean, um, I, it's almost uh, I, I, another thing that's been really amazing uh, has been watching some uh, some of the people who have kind of uh, blossomed in the network come from out of nowhere to really be participants on a on a very big level, both in their blogs and on Twitter and other places. And I think that, that in large part that, that has a lot to do with Twitter. Um, you can now drive traffic to the, the posts that you create and you know many people do that and I think that's a pretty good thing. So um, from a reality standpoint, you don't really have to be blogging to the empty room for very long these days. I mean, the other thing that I've been kind of reflecting on is, is um, it's, it's going to be in April 10 years since I started my blog. And I do remember blogging to the empty room for a long, long time. Um, I went back and looked you know, a few months ago, back in 2001, 2002, um, you know, and, and uh, it, it, was, it was a type of thing where if you didn't want to do it for yourself, you weren't going to do it for very long because there were just not a lot of people out there who were, who were really in, that, in, the, in the conversation very much. Look, I think blogging for its, for for blogging's sake is a great thing. I think that reflective piece of it and just that sharing piece of it, being transparent, um, that's all a big part of, of kind of uh, being a participant and um, and really being more transparent around around the learning that you're doing. Uh, and so uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with blogging to the empty room. I think it's it's a, a good thing to do. It, it's a, it's it's fine. But it's almost harder to do these days because of the many ways in which you can use other tools to connect those ideas to other conversations. I'm intrigued by something that may be related or almost its converse, which is I'll talk to somebody and they will assume that I've read their blog or I'm reading the things that they're currently working on. And I feel awkward that there are so many people that I would want to follow that I end up not, not reading a lot of what I would like to. Yeah, me too. And, and you know, I mean, um, I I don't do as good a job as I as I want to uh, in participating on people's blogs. I don't. Um, and some of that is just the kind of consequence of my life these days. But some of it, I think, too, has just been over the last six months, just kind of making a conscious decision to balance my life out a little bit more. And and when I'm home and with my kids, uh, you know, I'm home and with my kids, and I'm just not. I'm not taking the laptop out as much as I used to. Um, when I'm on the road, obviously, you know, I can tweet away and I can read and I have a lot more time to get all that stuff done. But, uh, you know, I, I think that, that uh, um, there's so much stuff out there right now. There's so many people who are, are writing so many good things that uh, it's, it's absolutely impossible to even, you know, dip your toe into, into even a little bit of it. So it's all good, but... Uh, it's, uh, it certainly makes it more difficult to, to track everything that's going on. One of the real themes in your work to me has been the educator as learner. Uh, do you want to expand on that yeah. a little? Yeah, actually, uh, ironically, Ed Week just um, uh, published a piece um, of mine about teacher about that, about teachers as learners first. I, I say that for a couple of reasons, and I, I think it's really important. Um, the first reason is because in many ways, I, I think in trying to make the case to individual teachers to uh, maybe do something different in the classroom, uh, I think it provides a way or a path for a lot of people to begin to participate without having the pressure of them going and, and using the tools in their classroom right away. You know, um, you know Cheryl and I and, 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 and almost all the talks that I do, we talk about the idea that you really need to do this for yourself first. Um, like I said, it is a, a, an amazing time to be a learner, so be a learner. Um, just enjoy that and and really uh, uh, make sense of it in your own practice. But obviously then if you're going to do this well in the classroom, I think you need to understand that the tools are not just about publishing. Uh, they really are about connections. They are about creating those networks. And that within those networks, connections within those contexts, that's really where the, the powerful piece of this is. So, um, uh, you know, it, it's important work for educators to do because if you don't, then you get a whole bunch of teachers, and there are lots of teachers out there right now still who are using blogs and, 
and using a lot of these tools without any idea as to what the tools are really all about. They see them as a way to take the stuff that they did on paper, put it in a digital format, put it up online, and then that's the end of the process when, you know, in reality, that's just the middle of the process these days. So um, it is about, you know, really doing it and understanding the, 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 the teaching piece of it um, that goes along with that. And, you know, I, I just think that uh, the one thing, and again, this is really difficult, and I, I try to navigate this as carefully as I can because I don't want anyone to hear that I'm, I'm putting down teachers in any way. I'm really not. But um, I do think that uh, my own kids have had very few models for learning in the classroom. They've had some great teachers. Um, they've had some people who have really stoked their fire, you know, in terms of, of, of learning and things like that. But I, I still think it's difficult when my kids don't have a lot of models and a lot of examples of adults who are, are immersed in these types of conversations and who are learning um, anytime, anywhere with anyone. Um, you know, that, that, uh, and how we do that well. So um, that's why I just think the focus has to be more on learning than teaching right now. And I do also think that, that at the end of the day, 20 years from now, who knows, right? We'll, uh, hopefully I'll be around to see if, if we're right or if I'm right about this. But I really do think that, that we're going to be hiring people for, in schools based on how, how, how good they are at learning, how much they know about the learning process rather than how much they know about a particular subject. Um, that, uh, that, that what the adults do in the classroom is going to have to be focused on really developing kids as learners, not as knowers necessarily. In, the, uh, in that article that you've mentioned, in the Education Week article, you talk about uh, schools wanting our kids to be knowers, not learners. And then you say, we must see our teachers as learners first and create a culture of learning within the four walls of school. This means giving teachers the time to explore their own passions and interests. Have you seen that modeled well anywhere? Well, I think there are places where there are teachers who are in that type of culture that um, I think supports them doing that, you know, that uh, they, there are some schools where there's, and, and you know, SLA is the obvious choice, I think, you know, Chris's school in Philly, and I, I know that Diana was here before, but I'm not sure she's still in the room, but yeah, she is, there she is. Um, it, I, I do think that, and, and Diana, you can certainly comment in there if I'm, if I'm getting this wrong, but I, I don't think that it's necessarily, you know, an expectation as, just as much as it is the, a, a culture that, that nourishes that type of learning for teachers, that that uh, that kind of breeds a passion in teachers to keep learning um, because there are environments where um, it really is about learning. It's it's not so much about teaching. Um, you can you can see a lot of the things, and Diana is generous enough to to tweet and to write about the, the work that she's doing in her classroom and. Um, and and you can see that she does a lot of stuff where it's it's just not about her. It's about what the kids are doing, and it's about what what uh, what she can learn from her kids as well. And I, I don't want to hold SLA up as the only place that that's happening because I know there are lots of, of classrooms and lots of, lots of pockets where that kind of culture exists now, and that's a great thing. But what we have to do is we have to make that systemic. We have to take that type of culture and make that the, the basic culture of schools. And we're far, far from that. Schools are, are still absolutely, at the end of the day, places where kids go to learn stuff, um, not necessarily where they go to learn how to learn. And um, that's just, it's just got to change. So you and I have had kind of a continuing conversation over the last couple of years, because as I've done the interview series, I've become less and less interested in the technology and more interested in the local building of learning cultures. But there's probably a good way in which those two intermix. How, how do you see Web 2.0, social media, or the tools of the internet playing into building local learning cultures? Well, you know, and I think that's that's the foundation of the work that Cheryl and I have been doing, and, and that's, you know, that's what Cheryl's real passion is. It's that community piece. It's, it, it really is, um, you know, 
thinking about ways that we can become communities of learners, um, not just networks. You know, networks are important, obviously, and networks have, I think, a, a, a whole lot of potential and a whole lot of power in terms of how they can drive the type of learning that we do on our own. But at the end of the day, as educators, um, you know, we really need to be in communities of learners and that those communities don't necessarily have to be in physical space any longer. In fact, uh, they, they shouldn't simply be only in physical space. So, you know, how do we build, um, uh, how do we build spaces and how do we make connections where uh, teachers can really feel uh, as a part of a learning community, not just a teaching com community. That's that's uh, and that's the question. And I, to be honest with you, and, and I know it's, it sounds a little self-serving, but I think we've done a pretty good job of that with PLP. And and you know, I, I think that uh, um, it, it's a pretty good model that at least gets people to the point where they understand the potential. Whether or not they take advantage of that potential, I think is is you know that's obviously up to the individuals. But um, we're just trying to uh, we're trying to create that that uh, opportunity and uh, and show people how it can be done. Well, do you want to talk a little bit about um, sort of the, the newer tools like Illuminate or synchronous meetings, handhelds? Are, are there things you're seeing where you feel like they're worth really noting right now? Yeah, I mean, you know, I I think that. For me, there's no question that that uh, the more you know, the more mobile that things get, the more interesting they're going to get. Um, and I think things are obviously going to get more and more mobile. So um, it, 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 I, I'm kind of interested to see over the next you know uh, three, five, seven years the types of ways in which which the uh, the stuff that we carry around with us is going to facilitate this type of interaction, for instance. Um, and, you know, I think we're kind of on the precipice of that already, but um, uh, I, I, you know, it's like you said, uh, the tools don't interest me that much until um, there's really uh, some some pretty obvious facilitation of connection, at least to me. It's almost like uh, what's that Clay Shirky quote? You know, the the tools don't get uh, interesting until they're ubiquitous. You know what I mean? So. Um, I've, I've kind of left the experimentation on all the cool new tools to other people, to be honest with you. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm kind of waiting. I, I wait more now to to see how other people are doing things um, before I, you know, invest uh, a lot of time into other 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 new new stuff. If there's one tool over the last six months, though, that I've I've just um, that has just become a huge part of my practice, it's Evernote, without question. And um, that particular tool has uh, has really changed a lot of the way that I kind of deal with information and and, uh, and think about information. So, you know, they're they're coming, they're out there now. They're they're brand new ones that people are starting to really really experiment. You know, do more than kick the tires with, and uh, I'm sure that they will. Uh, you know, those will, will kind of float up through the network at some point and and uh, gain some gain some pretty wide adoption. So, what is it that you like about Evernote? I, I use it all the day, all day long. For me, and yeah, for me, me in too. part, it's because <laughs> I never have to worry about backing up the notes that I make, and I can rearrange their organization so easily. What what do you find so compelling about it? Well, I I, I just think that it, uh, it it's my it's my outboard brain at this point. You know, uh, it's it's just so easy just to dump ideas in there to uh, uh, to really uh, just collect things audio, video, you know, whatever. Well, not video yet, but but audio and, and photos and and um, uh, text notes, whatever else. Um, you know, to me, I, I keep going back to the uh, NTPE literacies, right, where they talk about manage, analyze, synthesize multiple streams of simultaneous information. Well, that's the way I do it pretty much with Evernote. Now, the, you know, the irony about Evernote, though, and, um, and uh, I, I think it is kind of interesting, actually. Evernote has made me less transparent, though. Um, it, it is now, uh, they just came out with a new version for the Mac. I know they've had this for Windows for a while. That, you can now, you know, easily share notebooks within Evernote and make those make those uh, public, if you like, 
I haven't gotten my practice around that yet, and I, I sometimes feel somewhat guilty almost of hoarding all this stuff into Evernote without saving it to Deagle or Delicious or some of those other places where I used to put it. Um, so that's an interesting kind of push that's, that's, uh, that I'm kind of dealing with right now. But um, just as a place to just, you know, chuck ideas and, and to write down quick thoughts and uh, just to collect stuff and be able to retrieve it really easily. I mean, it's, it's just an amazing, amazing tool. Well, there was a, a New York Times column by David Brooks recently about modesty that related to the political dialogue and sort of the lack of civility. But one of the interesting trends about the web, and especially about personal websites, about.me or a blogging site that becomes your portfolio, is this balance between modesty and self-promotion. Uh, have you thought much about that, and, and do you give people advice on you know what's an appropriate balance? <laughs> Well, <clears throat> I think about that all the time, to be honest with you. Um, I, I, I don't, uh, well, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't want to in any way suggest that there, you know, one way is the best way or anything like that. I, I don't feel comfortable doing a lot of self-promotion. Every now and then, obviously, um, it's hard not to do that. I mean, you know, when you, when you start kind of putting your Twitter, your blog posts up on Twitter, that's self-promotion and you're, um, you know, you're, Disseminating information, giving away things, whatever else. Certainly, there's a there's a piece of that. And I mean, with the career that I have right now, going around and and uh, you know talking to schools, going speaking at conferences or consulting with groups, whatever else. I mean, part of um, you know part of what I have to do on some level is some self promotion. But um, it it uh, it's not something. I, I think it's really easy for me to see it. Um, to know it when I see it, when when it feels like people are just doing it a little bit too much, and I, I'll be honest with you, I don't like it. I mean, it's not. There's a spirit around the web of giving and sharing without really asking for anything back, and um, it's uh, it's you know depending on what you do and depending on what your profession and your career is, I know that it's somewhat of a difficult balance to to kind of uh, navigate that at times, but. Um, uh, I think that uh, I, I, I think it becomes kind of obvious when it's really about more about the person than it is about the ideas. And I try really hard, and I know I fail sometimes, but I try really hard to keep it about the ideas and not about the person as much as I can. Um, I just think that in the long run, that's a uh, uh, that's just a better you know it's just a better path to take. Well, we're going to shift to Q&A. We've got about 15 minutes left. If you've got a question for Will, you can uh, raise your hand using the hand with the green up arrow, or you can put it in the chat. Uh, hopefully, Aunt Tammy has collected a few. While, while you're getting your questions ready or thinking about them, well, a final question from me is, there's some debate about st the quality of student writing. Uh, especially when kids leave high school and get to the college level. Are, they, are these technologies helping them become better writers or worse writers? I know that my children write, write way more than I ever did, but we also hear a lot of college educators saying that the kids are coming uh, with worse writing skills. Have you got any sense of uh, how to approach that particular question? Well, I, you know, I, I taught writing for 18 years, and um, the only way you get better at writing is to write. Um, and 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 also have the you know, the feedback, the response, the reflective piece, you know, that that tells you or that gives you some sense of whether or not uh, what you're writing is is getting better, is if it's communicating the ideas, whatever else. Uh, look, I, I don't think this is really a technology question, though. You know, I, I think that that this is just um, again, writing has never been. Uh, uh, really cross-disciplinary. It's, it's, you know, we've talked about writing across the curriculum for decades, and it never really happens. Um, if we want to be, if we want our kids to be better writers, we have to give them opportunities to write, and we all have to be writers with them. You know, I, I think uh, there are those basic literacies that we ask the kids that I think, uh, you know, we need to kind of look in the mirror and ask ourselves if we're practicing those basic literacies as well. And I think uh, it's difficult. I'm not suggesting that it's an easy thing to do, but um, you know, that's, uh, if kids are going to college unprepared to write, that's not a technology problem. 
that's a curriculum problem. That's a, a, a teaching problem. It's a you know it's the, it's the way that we deal with it in schools problem. Okay, if you've got a question for Will, you can raise your hand. The hand with the green up arrow. We don't see any hands. So Tammy, I don't know how you've <laughs> been doing here. This is the I haven't I haven't followed the chat because it would have distracted me too much. <laughs> but if you got an obvious question right off the bat, Tammy, that we could give to Will. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's been <laughs> it's been flying by. I've gotten a few here. Um, someone asked, "How do I know when to abandon one tool for the new amazing tool?" Well, when you find out, let yeah. me know. <laughs> I mean, I saw I found out in I saw in the chat there. You know, a lot of people were kind of lamenting the imminent. It seems like the imminent demise of the oh, yeah. but I'm not sure that it's imminent. Um, you know, I, I think. As with anything, uh, you have to you have to be prepared for the tool to go away. Mm -hmm. Number one, um, I don't think you ever get so married to a tool that you couldn't live without it. But um, and Diane, I agree. I think delicious will be picked up. I'm not uh, I'm not too worried about it. Although I have backed up everything into DJ just in case. But um, you know, I I think that's the that's the job of the network um, in many ways. Um, that that uh, you know you don't have to try every tool and you don't have to go out there and, and mess with every single new innovation that comes down the pike. There are lots of people who will be doing that, and you can learn from them. Um, you know, I, I try as much as I can. You know, when I find something interesting to play with it and share my my experiences with it and then try to figure out why why it adds value. But I certainly don't do that with every tool that comes down the pike. So um, you know, if you're in the network. If you have a really good network, I think they can support you in all that kind of innovation as well. All right. Um, another question: How do we ensure that all kids have access to the kind of personalized learning you mentioned? It seems that that is critical. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree, and I think um, you know there are there are a number of defining questions that uh, are really big, hairy questions that we have to begin to answer, and that's absolutely one of them. Mm -hmm. Um, that's got to be at the top of the list. Number one, how do we make sure every kid has access? Uh, that's, I think, the number one question right now. And um, you know, after that, then how do we begin to really uh, help teachers and and help students leverage that access in ways that can really drive their own learning, uh, both on the adult level and the student level? And, you know, again, I think. Uh, if we are communities of learners, we have to be really adept at, at navigating these spaces and, and uh, making the most of what is available to us. It's not easy. It's a really difficult mm -hmm. thing to do. Um, and uh, so it all starts with uh, with access. And I can tell you, I mean, I, I, you know, I get the privilege of going around and going to a lot of different places, and I know there are. are uh, you know, lots of schools, lots of kids, lots of teachers that don't have access on a regular basis, and I just can't imagine how they're going to compete with the kids that do. This is a question from early in the conversation when you were talking about stories, uh, and admittedly, I wasn't uh, able to follow your talk as well since I was watching the chat go by. But uh, someone asked, if so many people are writing good things. Why is it so hard to get the stories you were talking about? Well, so I think you know the good news is there are a lot of people that are writing good things. The bad news is there are a lot of people who are writing good things for the people who already know that those good things are mm -hmm. out there. You know, yeah. I mean, that's that's one of the real issues here is that that you know we just we're not getting outside of our own groups in our own communities in our own networks very well. And Dan exactly right. We are preaching to the choir. And um, so it's all good that we're kind of, you know, sitting at our own virtual coffee shop and sharing all these great all these great ideas uh, with one another. But uh, I think what we have to do a better job of is sharing these ideas with people who aren't in the coffee shop yet. And mm -hmm. there, no, it looks like my bandwidth just dropped. So let me stop here for a second. Let's see if I can get it to catch up.
and mm -hmm. the chipmunk voice is back. So what I was going to say is that I think that we need to do a better job of getting outside of our communities and meeting people where they are. And um, maybe that means, uh, you know, writing uh, letters to the editor in newspapers, in magazine articles, uh, you know, doing presentations for parents at back to school night or something. But we have to uh, we have to take some of these great ideas that we kick around among ourselves and move them out so that other people. Well, perhaps uh, speaking to this, I just to end, uh, so what I have here. Uh, someone commented truthfully: curricular teachers are so busy. Class loads in middle school of 100 and plus students, lesson planning and grading and reports, etc. There are just so many hours in a day, and it's hard to keep up. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, look, I, I'm in no way suggesting that that is not the reality of teachers in this country and around the world. It absolutely is. And you look at state, you look at state budgets; it's going to get worse. Uh, and it's not going to get any better in in the near future. But um, you know what I what I try to say is then you know don't worry so much about trying to make this fit into what you're doing at school, but, but do worry about making it fit for yourself. And, you know, don't, don't give up your time to learn um, on your own around the things that you really care about, uh, because you will have opportunities to begin to model these types of, of uh, you know, these types of technologies and these types of learning communities and whatever else for your kids or for the people at your school. Um, and and uh, you can take advantage mm -hmm. of it if you you know if you've done it for yourself. So, um, hey, Tammy, you did I don't a great think there's job. anything wrong with being really I'm selfish you some and applause here. learning in, Way to go. in these networks. <laughs> and in these, hey, well, so I want to ask you a question time. because uh, I'm doing this thing. I I propose I'm going to TED Active and I propose to give a talk called "The Mistakes We Make When Thinking About Education Reform." So we set up a Google moderator list of where people could put up the mistakes that we that we make. And the one that's most popular right now is uh, trying to get teachers to teach collaboration when they themselves don't work in a 21st century collaborative environment. So if the idea is that in order to help teachers be prepared to help students, they need to be in their own kind of highly participative collaborative work environment, can we extend that even to the parents in the community? Meaning, is some of this not just getting the message out, but is it looking for ways to provide the kind of engaged activities and dialogue around education that would allow people to go through the thought process themselves? Well, you know, it's it's a great question, and I think you're absolutely right that uh, we have to we have to begin having these conversations more often with the people in our physical space communities. You know, it's like a little bit of what, what I just said. Um, ironically, too, if anyone's going to Educon uh, next week, um, that really is what my session is about. It's on uh, Sunday, the last session, so hopefully people will stick around. But um, basically, uh, you know, can we leverage our networks to really begin a conversation uh, at some type of scale with parents in our schools. Um, my kind of idea, and we're going to, I'm hopefully going to blog about this and then we'll have some time to flesh it out at, at, at Educon is, you know, can we have a national back to school night for parents where we deliver one consistent message about what's happening right now and give parents a way to start these conversations in meaningful ways um, you know, at their schools or uh, at uh, you know in their communities. I don't know if it's possible, but um, I think it's something that you know uh, we have a lot of we have a lot of nodes in this network right now, and uh, you know, can we get a thousand different places to uh, to bring in twenty people on one particular night and get twenty thousand people to start talking? I don't know. We'll see. Um, but. It's uh, it's got to be. You're right. It's got to be the type of thing that we do on a more regular basis. That we that we are more transparent about, and that we bring people into, um, you know, more than we're doing right now. So I, I know Vicky Abelles is doing this with her movie Race to Nowhere, kind of local meetings around education based yep. on her film. Um, I'm also just going to make a note here. The April 7th event we're holding with Bernard Jean Porter, we're going to talk about the use of the future search technology and the kinds of meetings that are 
um, community involving and if they could be applied. And I think she does apply these in an educational environment. So very interested, Will, in what you do there. Um, I'm going to make a comment about EDUCON as a big fan, both of Chris and SLA and, and the EDUCON conference. But one of the things I've noticed about EDUCON is it almost feels like there's this sense of uh, we don't like the way the education is being run. We'd like to create a better story, and we think we could run it better. I know that's not fair, but it does it does feel a little bit like replacing one system with another. And I'm really curious about can we get ourselves to a place where we're comfortable with um, uh, with the tension, the creative tension of different ideas, rather than feeling like we need to replace one system with another one. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that that's the sense I get from Educon, to be honest with you. I think that um, that's a, a group of, a gathering of a group of people who have lots of different stories and lots of different ideas that they want to float out there and, and go deeply into. You know, and I think um, that's why they're built, and I think they are conversations rather than presentations. Um, it's an opportunity for um, for a lot of people, if they want to, to sit down and just explore an idea at some depth for 90 minutes, and, and uh, it's not something that you normally get to do. Um, but I think it comes back to what we were talking about before, Steve, and that is that uh, I don't think that we're going to replace this system with one new system. If we do that, then we failed, I think. Um, this system is going, it, it's going to go away. I have absolute faith that it is going to go away. I don't know how long it's going to take. But um, it's going to be replaced by a lot of, I think, uh, you know, kind of more personalized, more unstructured um, types of learning environments, entirely different learning environments, as Kathy Davidson writes in, uh, you know, the that Mac MacArthur Foundation report that she did, uh, Living and Learning in the Digital Age, I think it was something like that. But, you know, we're going to have to get creative, and we're going to have a lot of different stories to tell, and there are going to be a lot of paths to getting an education. It's going to take some time, obviously, but um, uh, you know, it, like I said, if we replace this with something else, um, I don't think that that's going to be the best thing for our kids. Yeah, I really agree, um, and I think one of the sort of fascinating dilemmas is, is that uh, the question of scale sort of instantly comes into questions of education and it feels like there are so many good examples of so many schools doing good things but then the, you know there's this we get stuck on this well will it scale and I'm wondering does it need to scale meaning if big picture schools is doing a great job uh, in, in for the kinds of schools that they want to be running and others are running other kinds of schools um, you know can we get comfortable with it not having to scale well I think I, I hear what you're saying. I think there's some ideas that have to scale, though. And I, I think those ideas are the ones we talk about all the time, about making kids the center of the, of the learning that goes on in schools, uh, about giving kids more, more empowering kids to really drive their own learning, to, um, you know, to, to, to go out and, and really love learning instead of simply, you know, sitting in classrooms and, and being kind of forced to a whole curriculum that they're going to be tested on all the same way on the same day type of thing. So those ideas, I think, do need to scale. We need to think differently about what happens in schools. But how that ends up looking in any particular school, I don't think that there, I think there are lots of different ways of making that happen. Do we need a constitutional convention for education? <laughs> Uh, I just, I don't know what we need, but I, I think, I, I don't think it's a constitutional convention as much as it is just a, uh, a really, really big conversation about what learning and education looks like. And, and that to me is the, is, is the big unanswerable question right now. How do we get into the conversation about education and learning right now? Because it's just not happening uh, at the level or at the, kind of in the ideas that, that you know, we talk about. Uh, on a regular basis, so that's the question. Okay, well, you've been terrific to come on again. Uh, really fun to to have conversations in this environment with yeah. with a that large crowd. Really appreciate your work, your body of work, your insight, and the degree to which you are an influencer and uh, people care uh, care enough to to come out on a Tuesday night and pay attention. Yeah, really. Thank you very <laughs> much, everyone. That was. Uh, 
That was really amazing, to be honest with you. Okay, so the recording will be up later tonight. Thanks again to Learn Central Illuminate um, and all of you for coming. Please do consider coming to another show. Uh, we should have equally interesting conversations um, coming up. Well, have a great night. I know it's later there for you. I think you're two hours ahead of me tonight, so you're at 8 o'clock, but really appreciate talking to you again. Yeah, you, you too, Steve, and uh, go Jets. <laughs> okay, thanks, Will. In the interest of your schedule, we're going to let you go. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. I'll stick around for a few more minutes if anybody wants to brainstorm on anything or make comments. But we just sure do appreciate your being here. You, to exit the room, you just click on the X at the top right of your screen or go to File and Exit. And um, thanks again. Hey, thanks so much, Steve. Sorry you're not coming out east uh, this time for EduCon, but uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Yeah, I'm sorry to miss it. Yeah, I'll look forward to catching up with you at some point. All right, take care. Take care. Joshua, there is a Google Calendar. Uh, and I will get you the link for that. Uh, I think it's actually on Future of Education. If you go to, there's a link on that front page. We'll see if we can't find it. So Grant, uh, you would to, to download, you would just right click on the MP3 recording usually and you'd be able to save it as a file. I'm going to stop the recording because those of you who are listening to the recording don't need to hear all these other questions, but I'm going to go ahead and stop it. And thanks, everybody.